can watch it. Oh, you can see both. I had to show you the ice dance first. You know, you can see it. They won the gold medal. The question of the day, Leonard, your eyeballs are okay? It's Battery Man. Yeah, if anyone wants to buy um, raffle tickets for a Tesla at Garfield High School for their fundraiser, they sell a hundred dollars. And they only sell like, I can't remember, a thousand. So, so they're not going to make very much, then. Uh, maybe they sell 15, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, my kids don't go to Garfield. I have a friend that does. Isn't that my car? You know what's going on? Yeah, the car. Yeah, yeah. in the car. Yeah. 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 They did last year, they're doing it again this year. It's no, they're all going to get Garfield High School is, I can get just now if you want to buy a profit ticket for Tesla. They raise some money for Garfield. But we were riding up the T bar because we've just been waiting. Actually, we're going to sell Mike Kennedy's car. No. Yeah, on the T bar and at the bottom. Sorry, that black and blue just closed. We've tied the most metal because we have zero gold. I see a lot of car dealers trying to get the law passed. Like, very different. Right. 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 That made my whole day. Yeah, I didn't want to get away from that. I was like, just lost. Yes, yeah. Uh, what yeah. you have to do is just bring it right back. Because otherwise, I'm not going to be able to get involved in the head injury. On the other hand, it was only going to be a good thing. I know, I know. That was a spinal cord. That was a speed of me. Yeah, when you're talking so I like that model. I have the there So that tells me that it's a negotiation. I think that I think I'm hiring the bond yourself first. I think a lot of There'll be reps at booth, there'll be other people.
Instructed right after that, so it wasn't the best combination. No. President's weekend at a big dump. Oh, yeah. Now. Well, normally we wait for all the fellows to get here. I don't know. It's like two of them are sleeping in. We'll write that down on their report. <laughs> um, this, uh, I'm surprised they're not here. This is an, clearly an important topic in our field. The only uh, comment I'll make, especially for everybody on outside of this room listening, is the dinner down at the Quad AI meeting on Sunday, um, sort of rebelling against industry has become tremendously popular. I've got 47 people signed up to come, and you know it's nice as people are bringing children and family and uh, all kinds of entertainment. Hopefully, uh, so if anybody has an RSVP, we can we can make it even a bigger party. They're closing the whole restaurant just for our group. And we could probably accommodate up to 60 people. So if people have uh, missed or ignored my emails and still want to come, you could probably come up. Just let me know, you know, between now and the meeting. Uh, the other thing that is just sort of in the back of my mind, I'll just make note of it now. You know, for years we've had these meetings at 7 in the morning because, to my knowledge, the fellows had to get over to Children's for clinic promptly at 8 o'clock. That doesn't seem to be enforced anymore. I'll probably send out uh, a vote to see if next year people want to move the time maybe back to 7.30 by half an hour. No? Nick's an early riser. He doesn't seem to care. Oh, the parking because you don't have to worry about parking. Oh, that's well, true. Uh, that's true. Anyway, I'll throw it out there for a vote. Um, if Should only the people that come vote? <laughs> so that, I mean, that is a good point, right? You can park for free from there's 7 to 8. Uh, and that's uh, the commute over the bridge, there's nothing. Right. Half hour later, I think it's bad. Yeah. I and I rebelled the first time moving, you remember? I yeah. Didn't, uh, now, and now I like it. Now you like it, all right. All right, I guess forget that. Uh, <laughs> well, you can send out a memo. You can send out a memo. Well, I mean, the point is right. We might be overwhelmed by people who don't come in person, who don't care about parking and don't care about commuting. Yeah, they just want to sleep in. Yeah, and then I'll be in a bind as to which group to, to acknowledge. They ten votes and they only get one vote. Uh, no, I, yeah, I think it should be the people here. All right. I'm sorry. Gonna... <laughs> that was Mary Lasley. In case you didn't know who that was. Let's, let's go ahead and get started. We've got most everybody that usually comes is here, and hopefully we've got a good outside audience. So Erin has got, um, she changed the title that I gave her to War on Peanuts, but basically a review of uh, everything you need to know about peanut allergy. I need to know how to fix it, but she's not going to talk about that. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Altman. All right. Gotten feedback that I'm hard to hear, so let me know. I do not have any disclosures. Surprise. You eat peanut butter? <laughs> okay, maybe one disclosure. <laughs> so I'm just going to start with a brief history of the peanut. Basically, they were cultivated as early as the 1500s in South America by the native populations. They started to spread across the world with progression of European settlers. And then uh, roasted peanuts actually became a favorite food in the American Civil War due to their flavor, convenience, and shelf life. And then peanut production in the U.S. increased substantially after losses of cotton production due to the boll weevil infestation in the 1900s. 
and were subsequently declared an essential crop for the oil in World War II. In the 1980s and 1990s, peanut research started to focus on uh, the allergy part. Um, this was due to reports describing food allergy dating back to 1912, but in the 1990s, there were actually several deaths due to anaphylaxis. Therefore, public uh, was aware of this and money for research increased. Uh, now, after the peanut has supported us throughout history, both nutritionally and financially, is attempting a coup, which we may have instigated around the year 2000. Um, around that time, both the U.S. and the U.K. recommended that pregnant women uh, not eat peanuts, especially those at risk for allergic diseases such as um, atopic dermatitis if they themselves had a history of asthma or food allergy. Uh, and after that, we started to notice that peanut allergy prevalence increased and now uh, is affecting, uh, depending on which report you read, greater than 1% of children uh, and about 0.6% of adults. And the big question now, and a lot of what research is focusing on, is why and what do we do about this? That's just my little Mr. Peanut. All right. And this is just a graph depicting the childhood prevalence of peanut allergy over time. So you see back in 1997, it was about 0.4%. Uh, and it was recently as 2008, it was up to 1.4%. And it's continued to climb. Uh, this is just a brief kind of cartoon depicting the mechanism behind food allergy. Basically, you eat the peanut, uh, there's the peanut allergen, you form this response to it, and then we get uh, our IgE-mediated response. And so most of our treatments and everything are focusing, obviously, on blocking this or somehow trying to find some other way to get around it. All right. So, Aaron, what was the data? How did they collect that data on the, the prevalence over time? What, what was the... Just on studies of people either reporting peanut allergy or on some of the research projects that have been ongoing. Was it a phone survey or...? or There's a bunch of different surveys and questionnaires and some study groups that are being followed throughout time, whether it's in the U.S., U.K., and Australia has also got a big um, cohort. So... Um, these are all of the different testing mechanisms that I could find that had been used in the past, and I'll briefly talk about each one. Uh, the gold standard is still oral challenge, so we haven't found anything better than that as to date. Uh, atopic patch testing and also intradermal testing are not recommended. We don't really do that anymore. Um, skin prick testing we're all familiar with, and if we take uh, positive, considering it to be greater than or equal to three millimeters, and that gives us a sensitivity of about 95% and a specificity of about 61%. Serum peanut IgE is another common test that we use. Uh, positive is considered greater than 0.35. Um, and also, uh, it's got a good sensitivity, but not a great specificity. Uh, and then the big debate becomes, well, how do we know if an individual is sensitized versus allergic? Uh, and that's what basically breaks down into these office challenges with the, you know, watch, feeding them the food, watching, et cetera. Uh, and so on population-based studies in the U.S., they excluded individuals with self-reported peanut allergy. And even then in the general population, 8.6% uh, had a positive skin prick test greater than that three millimeters I mentioned um, and had a peanut-specific <coughs> serum IgE level um, higher than 0 0.35 and about 8% as well. And this is similar to results found in the UK and also Australia. And due to this, it's difficult to diagnose peanut allergy based on just skin prick testing or serum IgE alone, or excuse me, serum peanut IgE alone. And therefore, we end up doing oral challenges in the office. And the concern with this is obviously the risk of anaphylaxis. It's expensive. It's time consuming, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, there, history negative people ingesting peanuts with no problem. The, these percentages, yes. Yeah. All right, and so that led to search for a new test, a new diagnostic strategy. So in 1917, Johns and Jones described two primary globulins, arachin and conarachin. Uh, and then in 1991, Dr. Burks documented the first major peanut allergen, which was termed era H1. 
Um, the definition of major allergen is traditionally defined as a protein that binds the allergen-specific IgE in about 50% of allergic individuals. And based on that definition, uh, era H1, 2, and 3 would be major allergens for peanut. There's also a new proposed definition based on protein responsible for the majority of the effector activity, which is basically monitoring um, its binding to the FC epsilon R1 receptor and the cross-reactivity and release of contents by basophils and mast cells. And if we use that definition rather than just pure IgE recognition, then era H2 and 6 would be the new kind of major allergen to peanut. Uh, and so far there have been 11 proteins on the peanut that have been identified, um, basically just era 1 through 11. Uh, era 1, 2, and 3 are the seed storage and heat stable proteins. Era 6 is a homologue of era 2. And then era H, 8, excuse me, is the birch pollen homologue and is heat labile. And you'll see where that comes into play a little bit later. Uh, basically, the era protein uh, sensitization is uh, varied based on region and they think that that's likely due to other exposures. Um, so for some reason, the Mediterranean populations have a higher rate of era H9, which is actually associated with significant peanut allergy that we don't necessarily see as much of in the US. The US is more associated with era H1 and H3, although severe allergy is strongly linked to era H2 and 6. Sweden is a birch rich region, and therefore you see higher uh, individuals with era H8, and the children um, a majority could tolerate peanut after heating uh, due to the lability of that protein. Uh, the severity or the natural course of peanut allergy is only about 10 to 20 percent of children will outgrow this, and these may be the children with era H8. We haven't really looked into that in depth. Uh, however, higher levels of peanut IgE and now era H2 are associated with lifelong allergy. I'm just going to talk a little bit more about era H2 because this has been a big focus of research recently in regards to testing. Um, so therefore, it's the dominant peanut allergen. Uh, this uh, study, Dang et al., was actually done in Australia. The subjects were 11 to 15 months old, which was nice because based on uh, a lot of the westernized countries' prior recommendations, these children weren't necessarily eating loads of peanut at the time. So we got a pretty clear picture of the individual. Um, so these children underwent skin prick testing and also oral challenge, and they were divided into allergic and control. And the allergic were the ones that reacted to the oral challenge and the skin prick test. And they considered anything greater than one millimeter on the skin prick test positive. Um, and so they got a pretty even distribution there. And then they also underwent blood testing for peanut IgE and also era H2. If the era H2 was less than 0.35, then they were also tested for era H1, 3, 8, and 9. So it's kind of a reflex test. They used a prior 95% uh, threshold for diagnosing peanut allergy, so that would include skin prick test greater than 8 millimeters or peanut IgE greater than 15 units. The skin prick test greater than 8 millimeters was found in 50%, excuse me, 57% of allergic subjects and 35% with a skin prick test, three to seven millimeters, excuse me, three to seven millimeters um, had an oral food challenge. Uh, so that's kind of the standard if we have people um, that come into the office, <laughs> skin prick test is between three to seven millimeters, then we consider the food challenge, depending on history. Peanut Ig greater than 15 was found in 26% of the allergic subjects and 65% of these individuals, or excuse me, 65% of the allergic subjects were between 0 0.35 and 15. In the non-allergic, less than 3% would have an incorrect diagnosis. Uh, and then they looked at the actual level of area H2 and how that corresponded with peanut IgE. And they found that uh, at a level of 0 0.46 units, there was a 95% specificity and 73% sensitivity compared to the corresponding peanut IgE uh, 2.12 with uh, similar specificity and sensitivity. Uh, the standard peanut IgE cutoff level of 15 units um, corresponded to an error H2 level of 1.19, um, which also had a greater specificity and sensitivity than the peanut IgE. Uh, and therefore, uh, in this study, they found that ARH2 identified more patients with true allergy 
one levels with 95% specificity were applied compared to skin prick testing and peanut IgE. And therefore that leads us to how best to actually determine a diagnosis of peanut allergy, knowing what we know about individuals who are sensitized versus allergic, and now adding in this error H2 test, is it actually beneficial? Uh, therefore, multiple studies compared different testing methods, um, compared them to the gold standard, which was the double-blinded oral food challenge, uh, and most of them found that uh, regardless of the testing results, history uh, still remained the critical component. However, there are some new guides that they recommended after doing some of these studies, which do incorporate that error H2. Um, so here's just a brief overview of some of the combination testing that's been looked into. Um, they looked at skin prick test plus peanut IgE. And if the skin prick test was less than seven millimeters and the peanut IgE was less than two, then these individuals uh, typically had peanut tolerance. And that was found in 95% of individuals. There was a better sensitivity and negative predictive value than either test alone. And those are two of the studies that looked at this combination of testing. There are also several studies in the UK, uh, I believe uh, one of them was also in the US, where they used these different quote calculators. Uh, and these were based on um, questionnaires as well, using age, sex, risk factors, skin prick testing, peanut IgE, total IgE. Um, and although they used some of the, some of the calculators were very similar, there was no uh, rep of the results that they had with these, and therefore they've been kind of pushed to the other side. And, and most of this is basically take a good history and pair it with some testing. Uh, and then recently there were several studies looking at skin prick testing, peanut IgE, and ERA H2, and combinations of these tests. And basically, um, Dang et al. Uh, found that a positive skin prick test followed by ERA H2 decreased the need for oral food challenges, and a similar study uh, performed by Lieberman et al. looked more at the actual peanut IgE paired with ERA H2, and they also had similar results that if you use ERA H2 as a secondary test uh, with the peanut IgE, then that also led to decreased oral food challenges. When you use the term ERA H2, you're referring to specific IgE? Yes, to yes. Correct. No one's prepared that as a skin test material. No, it's all serum blood testing. Is that on the horizon? Are people capable of making ERA H2 for as a skin test material? I did not see anything looking into that. However, there's a different one they're looking at called epitope mapping, where it's a little more specific than just the actual protein. It's specific pieces of each protein, but no skin tests that I saw. When you can get the peanut component panel test now through Quest. Yeah, for a serologic test. Right. I'm just curious, you know, you right. know what protein that is. You would think right. someone could synthesize it and you could skin test with it. Right. But so you don't have to go through the, you know. Well, the, uh, you can just order it through Quest, just like you'd order a peanut or an egg. Thermo or Fisher, you don't have to go to Thermo Fisher right. for and the it's, specific test. And if you order it, then it's... Right. I mean, clearly they must have the reagent to do the serologic test. Right. Yeah, yeah they, they have the protein, protein in hand. Yeah, but no. I well, there's a protein. What is ARH2 again? Back to that other slide. Uh, it's, the best. it's the it's seed, the seed best. storage protein, and it's heat stable. Right. So you can make it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Maybe we need a fellow good brother. Fellow. All right. David and Matt. A fellow. 200 year fellow. Yeah, that's right. Need funding for twenty. So this years. is just a graphical depiction uh, comparing peanut skin prick test, the ERA H2 serum IgE, and the peanut serum IgE levels according to their specificity and sensitivity. And that's basically what these studies were looking into, both the Dang and Lieberman. Um, and then these are some of the recommendations of a stepwise approach that they came up. The first here is uh, what Lieberman proposed, and they looked at just the serum IgE, no skin prick testing, along with the serum ERA H2. And so basically they took their positives, which were greater than 0 0.35 units, and they had 112 individuals, and then they did an uh, oral challenge. And so based on just using the serum IgE greater than that level, they found that the oral food challenge, about 56% uh, were positive and 40 4% were negative. 
So just basing off the serum IgE is not a great uh, predictor. So then they use the uh, peanut IgE plus uh, secondary testing with ARAH2. Same cutoff level of 0.35 for the uh, IgE. And if ARAH2 was positive, then when they proceeded to the oral food challenge, uh, about 91% were positive and about 9% were negative. So it's a little bit better there uh, in regards to deciding if you want to do an oral food challenge. And was the era H2 positive? Was it just zero point? Yeah, greater than 0 0.35. They used the same cutoff. Um, Dang was the only one that looked at different levels of the era H2 IgE, trying to get a better idea of what the cutoff should be. Um, and so then you can see if the era H2 is negative after having a peanut IgE greater than 0 0.35. Uh, also, um, the oral food challenge, there was about 20% that would still be positive, uh, but 80% negative. So it's pretty decent. When you look at the oral food challenges, is this anaphylaxis or are these just people have an itchy mouth or a rash? They included everything. So anaphylaxis, itchy mouth, stomach ache, vomiting. So a lot of these oral food challenges are not going to be anaphylaxis. Correct. Um, they use mostly kind of any symptoms. So if you were in the office and your kid said, oh, my mouth is itchy and you stop, that's basically what they would consider a negative. 21% okay. is kind of high. Isn't it? Yeah. So again, I mean, so far there's no great test, uh, but this is the best that we've gotten so far in regards to what I could find in the literature. Uh, the other side was looking uh, not only at a positive peanut IgE of greater than 0 0.35, but then also breaking it down on greater than 15 or less than 15. Uh, and that had a little bit better rate. And as you can see then at the bottom when they, they paired that with the era H2, um, if your peanut IgE was greater than 15 and you had a positive era H2, then basically you were peanut allergic. So it helps with, you know, kind of the extremes, but there's still that middle ground that's a little gray. This was uh, the other one done in Australia by Dang et al. And they actually looked both at the peanut serum IgE and also skin prick testing. And they broke it down a little farther. So they've got <clears throat> groups that are less than 0 0.35 units for the peanut IgE if they're between 0 0.35 and 14.9 or if they're greater than 15 um, to try to see if they could better decrease the need for oral food challenges in the office. So after they broke it down into these individuals, then they would subsequently test for ARAH2 uh, and again broke it down into different levels. So it wasn't just greater than 0 0.35 indicated positive ARAH2. They broke it down into less than 0 0.1, 0 0.1 to 1.0, and greater than 1.0. And that's all based off of that um, graphical depiction I showed earlier on where they made these cutoffs for ARAH2. Uh, and it, it did decrease oral food challenges, but again, you know, it's not a perfect test. Um, basically, we're just increasing the specificity and not really altering sensitivity. Uh, this was what they proposed for testing an allergy clinic because they assumed that um, primary care physicians could order the serum testing but couldn't do the skin prick testing. Uh, and so their model for testing in allergy clinics included the peanut skin prick test. Um, along with subsequent testing for ARA H2. Uh, and they had the best results with that. So basically they found that if your skin prick test was between three and eight millimeters and you subsequently tested for ARA H2 and your ARA H2 was between 0 0.1 and 1.0, then you would do an oral food challenge and that led to about 21 oral food challenges uh, versus if we go back, there was 32 um, using the peanut serum IgE plus ARA H2. So it decreased a little, but you know, not great. Uh, future tests are... Yeah, I'm telling you, it's the outcome of those challenges. So they're just deciding who to challenge and who not to challenge. Correct. They're trying to aid in our decision making. And the oral, the oral challenges, the ones that were suspect of being peanut allergic, and I believe the 20, or I'm sorry, I had it on the, what was this? This slide. Um, so this showed the positive. So if you had a skin prick test of greater than eight 
millimeters uh, than 35 percent. Or I'm sorry, I had it. I thought I had it on this slide, um, but basically, this was looking more at decreasing the need for oral food challenges and not necessarily the outcome because it was separated in the beginning to the allergic versus non-allergic. So they already knew which ones had failed the oral food challenge and which ones hadn't. Does that make sense? So all of these results are already based on individuals that we knew had either. These people all came with a history of a reaction to peanut of some kind. Yes. So the so study. got the numbers there. Like yeah. for look at the um, yeah. 32 oral food challenges, 27 are peanut allergic and five were peanut tolerant. So essentially, they're telling you that's whatever that percentage is, is what, you know, that they did 32 oral challenges and 27 were reacting. Is that right? Yes. And th five didn't react. Okay. So no, no, no. Are. Yeah, yeah, they are. They just don't give you the percentages. Yeah. And these, again, are based on people that in the beginning they had already separated out. So they knew in the beginning based on the oral food challenges they did before looking at all of this, which ones were allergic mm -hmm. and which ones weren't. And they were just trying to compare testing modalities. Uh, future tests that they're looking into are epitope mapping. Um, basically, that's IgE binding to specific segments of proteins, in particular um, the proteins I mentioned in the era eight, era one, two, three, and then six is the same as two. Similarly, anyway, um, and preliminary results show that the larger number of epitopes bound the more uh, sensitive the person may be to peanut, but no great results so far looking into that. Um, other studies are looking at T cell proliferative response to peanut and or the components that I talked about um, or basophil activation, but I don't have any results of a lot of these tests yet and nothing that's uh, significant in regards to, oh, this is our miracle test that we don't have to do any more challenges. So. Now that we have diagnostics nailed down, or everyone's confused, uh, we will proceed to actual treatment of peanut allergy. Uh, currently, avoidance is still our mainstay treatment, uh, but other uh, areas are looking into uh, sublingual, subcutaneous, oral, and uh, the newest one is the epicutaneous patches, peanut patches, and that's still under clinical trial. Uh, and though I've heard, um, we had uh, Dr. Nadeau, Nadeau come, come speak with us, that there's good results so far and nothing's been published. Uh, so subcutaneous immunotherapy, basically clinical trials started uh, in the 1990s, but due to a lot of side effects uh, and also anaphylaxis, it was deemed an unsafe therapy. Uh, and these are a few of the clinical trials uh, that looked into it. And basically it worked, subjects had a significant decrease in skin prick tests and less symptoms with oral challenge, but the rate of systemic reactions in one of the studies was 13%, uh, which was unacceptable. Then in 1997, another study took a small group of patients, only 12, uh, and they were able to achieve the maintenance dose. Uh, however, um, only three could tolerate it without significant side effects. So again, that one's mostly been abandoned. I don't see a lot of new research coming out in this area. What happened in that trial was it um, killed somebody. Yeah. The, the blinded study, you remember, and the pharmacy right. mixed up the, yeah. the placebo. Got the active drug drugs. instead of placebo. Okay. So then uh, studies started to focus on sublingual therapy. Um, the thoughts behind this are that the Langerhans cells take up antigen in a tolerogenic manner to downregulate the allergic response, and therefore you can use less of the extract. Um, and so therefore the aqueous extract of peanut proteins was combined with 50% uh, glycerol saline solution and some phenol preservative. Uh, the individuals are told to hold it under their tongue for one to two minutes. You start at a low dose just like you would with allergy shots and increase to maintenance. Uh, and then doses in uh, SLIT, sublingual, are several orders of magnitude smaller than in oral immunotherapy. Um, and again, that's due to the uh, ability of the Langerhans cells and the oral mucosa. Uh, Kim et al. Uh, published a study in 2011. It was a randomized control trial of children's ages 1 to 11. They were escalated to 250 nanograms of peanut uh, protein extract on the start day. 
and then uh, built up over the next six months to the maintenance dose of two milligrams of peanut protein. At 12 months, they performed an oral challenge, and the median tolerated dose at that time was about 1,700 milligrams of peanut protein compared to 85 milligrams in the placebo group. Uh, there was another study done by Fleischer et al. They took 40 subjects aged uh, 12 to 37, so a little bit older. Uh, they underwent a baseline oral challenge to determine which dose would elicit symptoms, and then started the slit with placebo or peanut, and then the placebo actually crossed over at 44 weeks. So you may have started on placebo and then at 44 weeks underwent testing, and then you would cross over to start slit therapy. And the reason they did this is that the crossover group at 44 weeks started at an escalated uh, therapeutic uh, regimen, and I have, I have a picture that will show that. Um, so basically at 44 weeks, 70% of the responders in the peanut group uh, tolerated uh, five grams of peanut powder which was about 2.5 grams of actual protein, or they had a tenfold increase from their baseline oral. So that's how they determined if they were actually responding to therapy. Uh, and that 44 weeks, the median consumed was about 496 milligrams, which increased from the baseline median of 3.5 milligrams in these individuals. And again, these were the ones receiving the actual therapy. At 68 weeks, the median consumed increased to 996 milligrams. And that was across all of them because at 68 weeks, that included not only the original uh, individuals on slit therapy, but also the crossover group. This is the one that was just published in the paper about a week ago. But they talked about peanut flour in England and then after they did it as outpatients, yeah. the people actually took the flour home and gave it to their kids at home. It could be, there's a couple that actually did that. I don't know which newspaper article you're referring to, sorry. Oh, so but there are a couple studies where they were sent home yeah. Right. It was just about a week or two ago because a bunch of patients brought it in for me to read and see if I was ready to do that for it. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. And I think that may be more with the oral challenge. Um, these individuals took home the actual sublingual extract, whereas in the oral challenges, they do take home the powder and are recommended to take a certain amount with food. This was specifically measured out amounts of powder that the patient's yeah. parents entered into their food on yep. the schedule. Yep. And I have those studies in here as well. So that's different. This is a little bit different. Um, this is the sublingual, so it's more of the liquid. It's not the powder that they put under their tongue. And this is just their um, example of their dosing schedule. And what I wanted to highlight was uh, down here, arm A, that's those individuals that first started. And then arm B are the ones that crossed over at 44 weeks. So they went to a higher maintenance dose is basically what they were looking into. Uh, and this is just comparing the crossover group to the initial treatment group at 44 weeks. So you can see in the placebo, um, this is the amount of peanut that was successfully consumed during oral challenges. Um, and then as you look, basically at 44 weeks of the treatment group, they were able to consume much more peanut. And then at the crossover high group, uh, about the same. There's a little bit higher uh, peanut uh, consumption with the crossover group, but not much compared to the original a lower dose slit group. And both were significantly higher than placebo. Uh, this was the basically overall, so they looked at visit on week 44 and then also 68, which I had mentioned. Um, and you can see that by week 68, all of the individuals were able to tolerate a much higher dose of peanut than they were at baseline, whether they had crossed over or not at the 44 weeks. Uh, and then they also looked at peanut IgG4. Uh, and the, the reasoning behind this is that in other desensitization uh, therapies, such as um, allergy immunotherapy and also venom immunotherapy, there's different uh, immunologic changes that they follow, and one of which is IgG4. And they found that as uh, IgG4 increases, um, people will have a higher incidence of tolerance. And so they're looking at uh, hopefully having an increase in IgG4 in these individuals, indicating that they may have those changes present, which would make them more tolerant to peanut. It's kind of a, a long drawn out explanation. Uh, but as you can see, if you look at the higher dose, the ones that crossed over at 44 weeks, their IgG4 
uh, increased a little bit more than the lower dose slit individuals. Aaron, did they look at the regulatory cell changes at all? They did. Um, here's, here's the ones that they looked at. I tried to put it in a chart because it gets confusing. Um, they looked at several different things and basically they looked at, uh, at week 29, 44, and 68. They compared all of these to baseline. They looked at skin prick testing, peanut IgE, peanut IgG4, and then also basal flow activation, which is looking at that CD63. Um, some studies did look at T regs, uh, but it, it, it was random on what uh, individuals chose to follow. Um, and so in this study, the skin prick test decreased, the peanut IgE increased initially and then decreased basically back to baseline, so there was really no change. The peanut IgG4, as I talked about, did increase, which was a good sign, and then the basal flow activation, they did not find a significant change in the study. Aaron, before you move on, did they, oh. take, did they take those, what looks like three or four people who had tremendous increases in their IgG4 and challenge them to see if they actually tolerated peanut? If you go back to that, yeah. This one? Uh -huh. There's looks like three or four people in each of those studies that just made huge responses. Yes, and so that's where it came into play at the very end on week 68 when they did that oral challenge and individuals could tolerate up to close to 1,000 milligrams of peanut as compared to the baseline, which was like three milligrams of peanut. Um, that's what they, they didn't look at, they do probably have tables of these individually. I just went with the overall. Okay. So, um, but there was, there was significant changes in everyone. There was, there was really not an individual that couldn't tolerate even their baseline dose, so. So naturopaths actually have it wrong. When, <laughs> when they measure IgG4. Correct. And the ones that are positive, yep. really those are the people that are tolerant and they shouldn't yes. be telling them to take it away. Yeah. Right? They should say the ones that are negative are the ones that they're allergic to. In the, all of the, yes. In I all, mean, it's the opposite. At least in all the peanut studies I found, if your IgG4 goes up to peanut, those individuals were more tolerant. So they don't measure four, they just measure Oh, they do. They measure IgG4. And IgA. IgA. Yeah. So it depends. But they I told not, me to get, I didn't they see told me to get rid of it anyway, so it really doesn't matter. Right. <clears throat> Did any of them go on to actually yeah. tolerate the nuts and a day to day I will get to that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Spoiler. All right. So this is oral immunotherapy, and this is the one that's uh, most prominent right now. Most studies use the peanut flour, uh, and that's 12% fat, 50% peanut. Uh, so not, there's a little bit lower calorie there. Uh, there's three phases typically. There's the initial escalation, then there's the buildup phase, and then there's the maintenance phase. And then I put number four down here as tolerance question mark, because that's what's being looked into right now, uh, and so far, the results are iffy. Uh, so basically in 2009, uh, Jones and his colleagues took 29 subjects uh, who were tolerating 300 milligrams of peanut protein daily, and about 27 out of the 29 passed an oral challenge with, with, with close to 4,000 milligrams of peanut consumption. And so again, these are individuals who do take home the peanut powder and eat it themselves every day. Uh, another group looked at individuals age 1 through 16. They had 28 subjects. They were randomized to placebo with oat flour or active peanut flour. And they were able to achieve a maintenance dose, again, of about 4,000 milligrams. Um, they tolerated this for one month. And then if they were able to do this, they took them back in and performed an oral challenge at 12 months. And six, all 16 of the active individuals in the, in the uh therapy group passed the 5,000 milligram or about 20 peanut oral challenge at 12 months. So evidence looked great and it was also supported by other trials in Germany and England. So they thought, well, this is fantastic. Um, then let's look at how long we can do this in the future and can people ever get off the peanut therapy. Uh, these are just some pictures showing the peanut oral immunotherapy versus placebo. And this was the oral challenge performed at 12 months. And you can see, obviously, individuals on the oral immunotherapy did much better than individuals on placebo. Uh, this group also, or Varshney, um, also looked at skin prick tests at 0 and 12 months compared to the peanut oral therapy and placebo. Uh, and the skin prick test decreased 
at 12 months and individuals who were receiving the immunotherapy. They also looked at peanut-specific IgE, and again, they noted the uh, rapid increase in the peanut oral immunotherapy and then subsequent decrease back towards baseline versus placebo where there's really no change. And these, this group also looked at the peanut-specific IgG4. And as Dr. Lastly pointed out, the higher the IgG4, uh, the more tolerant the individual here. So you can see in the peanut oral immunotherapy, the IgG4, by the time they hit that 12th month mark, was significantly higher than in the placebo group. And again, all 16 individuals on the oral immunotherapy were able to tolerate 5,000 milligrams of peanut at that 12 month oral challenge. Uh, so here's uh, a little more in depth table. And this again was based on that Marshney et al. group, and they looked at several other markers. Uh, so as I mentioned, skin prick test was decreased. The peanut IgE had no change overall. And peanut IgG4 increased. And then they also looked at IL-5, IL-13, and T regulatory cells. And the reasoning behind this is they were looking at cytokine production to switch from Th2 allergy towards a Th1 response or more production of T regulatory cells. And they did note that IL-5 and IL-13 decreased, um, signifying that the Th2 response uh, was no longer ramping up, and then T regulatory cells also increased in regards to the peanut. So that's what the natural paths were uh, Then there was a larger trial called the STOP2 trial. This looked at 99 children ages 7 to 16. Uh, these children uh, had a positive skin prick test and oral challenge to peanut. They had a random assignment to 26 weeks of oral immunotherapy versus placebo. And then this is another one of those crossover studies. So they would cross over after the oral challenge. Um, basically, 24 out of 39 passed an oral challenge to 1,400 milligrams, and they had similar immunologic changes as the previous studies that I just talked about. Um, so then comes the debate of sublingual versus oral. Uh, which one should we use? Which one is better? Do we know? Uh, there was one study, or I guess one letter to the editor I found that tried to compare some of the studies to each other. And basically what they came up with is that both can induce desensitization. However, the oral food challenge, you can reach a higher level of uh, peanut protein tolerance and also had greater immunologic changes. Um, the problem is, is that with the sublingual therapy, you get less uh, adverse reactions. It's mostly oral, um, whether it's mouth itching, uh, swelling, etc. Whereas with the oral immunotherapy, they had several more severe reactions, but nothing near as close as the uh, uh, subcutaneous that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and therefore, it's deemed relatively safe and uh, preferred over the sublingual immunotherapy at this point. There was a look at omalizumab or anti-IgE to be used in conjunction with some of these therapies. Uh, and I know we had someone mention it uh, earlier this year, but basically uh, it just helped rapid uh, desensitization and a decreased amount of side effects. There was no actual cure uh, using omalizumab. And again, to get those benefits, you would have had to stay on it the whole time which is expensive. So just to summarize, so basically what I was able to find was that combination testing with skin prick test and error H2 can decrease the need for oral food challenges performed in the office if you take those studies at face value. Also, after we diagnose peanut allergy, we can desensitize with oral immunotherapy, hopefully in the future. And then what after that? Is there anything showing that people actually become tolerant? Can we ever stop the immunotherapy and have people go out and eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Burks looked at this in 2012 and then Vickery in 2013. They had 24 subjects, age one through 16, that they treated for up to five years with oral immunotherapy. Uh, they did 4,000 milligrams a day of peanut protein for the maintenance dose. And then the oral challenge consisted of 5,000 milligrams 
And this was only performed if people were able to get up to that maintenance dose of 4,000 milligrams uh, and their peanut IgE was less than 15. If they passed this oral food challenge, then they stopped the oral immunotherapy. Then they did a repeat oral challenge and open feeding, which is one serving of peanut butter four weeks after stopping. 11 out of 12 individuals passed this and they considered this sustained responsiveness. One failed and resumed oral immunotherapy. Then those other 12 individuals had an oral challenge after five years of oral immunotherapy, regardless of the peanut IgE serum level, and only one out of 12 passed. So basically everyone started, once your peanut IgE was less than 15 and you were at maintenance, you stopped it and did another challenge. If your peanut IgE never got less than 15, you were followed for five years, and then they're like, well, let's try it anyway. And at that point, they did not have very good results. Did they look at the, those markers, the skin test, and the IgE yes. before they did that? Yep. Uh -huh. We have a question here from the outside audience, sort of back to the first half of the test, whether insurance is covering ARA H2 uh, testing. That I don't know. Anybody know? Mary, do you know? Well, no. I, I, yeah, I order them. I haven't been able to find out yet. You know, because obviously we... Well, it's through we, Quest. Do it through right. Quest. Exactly. But I, I, don't, I mean, I haven't had anyone no. complain. I've, I mean, I've ordered no. a handful. Yeah. But I, I haven't had anyone complain about it. It's not like going through the UNO peanut test where they have to pay $300 out of pocket. Right. I just, I in just in included other words, the check. have the kit and send it right from your office. I don't know. We don't know the answer to that. But I send them to children's we, we to get, get their the blood bill. drawn. And they we just... don't get the bill, but we should maybe follow up with parents or whatever. The answer is not sure, but nobody's complained that their bill was... No. No. He has to pay it first. No. They're so scared. They're is Quest actually duplicating or just sending it on to Thermo Fisher, who actually does it? I think they're just sending it on to Thermo Fisher, but it's, you know, the advantage is if they need other tests, you know, you can just do a one-stop shopping instead of... I have to separate the serum or whatever. All right. <clears throat> so they did look at different uh, labs during this study, and they found that there were some predictors of success. At baseline, if your peanut IgE to total IgE ratio was lower, then you had a better uh, success rate of the oral food challenge. Also, they looked at ARH2 IgE at the study end, and if your ARH2 level was high, that was a poor predictor. If it was low, uh, you had a better chance of tolerating the oral food challenge. And at both of these, at baseline and at study end, the level, total overall level of peanut IgE was the second best predictor. So the lower your peanut IgE, the better you did in regards to the oral challenge. So again, nothing that was drastically different than some of the other studies that have been done. For the patients who are on maintenance, 4,000 gram, uh, grams a day, or milligrams a day of peanut protein for a long period of time, do they have reactions when they're on their maintenance phase or not? I mean, the, if they had the reactions, then it was. Well, or, we're, we're, I know the build, we were talking about reactions during the correct. Yep. Before. What about during the maintenance phase? Are there still. Time During the maintenance, reaction. there were some that would have some oral symptoms, but nothing that wasn't tolerable by the patient. So it wasn't like they were having daily hives or respiratory symptoms. Uh, the most would just be some oral itching. Yeah. So. Aaron, do you remember the, the study where I think they took uh, prick tests of three to eight or something like that? Mm -hmm. And then the, if the error age two was 0.1 to one, yes. five of those people passed? Yes. Were they the ones with the like 0.1 or 0.2, do you know? Or I'm just curious if they were, you could tighten up that range and further eliminate, you know, sort of risky food challenges. Or yes, and I brought that paper with me, and they curious. never commented on a specific level. The best they could do is they used uh, one point, I think it was 1.9 or 1.12 as their cutoff for a quote positive era H2 based on that versus the 0 0.35. Right. So I think, you know, if you were lower than that, you probably did better, uh, but it was also variable. They couldn't. And these are, you know, as much as we like to think they're large studies, it's still maybe 50 individuals. So it's difficult to really get a, a good idea. Um, 
These are some novel therapies that are being looked at. Uh, phytochemicals is one of which, and these are basically small molecules from plants. Uh, and they're used in traditional Chinese medicine. And so they've developed uh, two different formulas, and the one that they, there was uh, basically the FAHF1 and FAHF2. And they found that the FAHF2 actually worked. Um, it's composed of nine herbal extracts. I'm not exactly sure what's all in it. But basically, mice were treated for five weeks, and they had no reaction with oral challenge. They had a decreased peanut IgE and increased peanut IgG2A, a decreased basophil activation, and then cytokines consistent with a decreased TH2 response. So they thought, well, this is great. Let's try it in humans. So humans uh, took six tabs three times a day for six months of this herbal extract, and they had decreased basophil activation, but it's still an ongoing investigation, so I'm not sure if they're passing oral challenges or if they're just looking at uh, laboratory results right now. What's known about peanut allergy in China? You would think with Chinese people eating these herbal remedies all the time, they wouldn't have spontaneous peanut allergy. I didn't see a lot of studies looking at the Chinese prevalence. I don't know if that's just because we're not as close with them. They but peanuts. yeah, so the one I mean, U.S., Canada, Australia, U.K. are the ones with high peanut allergy. But other Western European countries, France, um, and then also Israel, have lower. So they probably start their babies early in right. China on peanuts, yeah. right? They're not waiting. Yeah. And then there's also they've looked at studies for peanut oil, and if you use crude peanut oil, there's actual peanut protein in it versus refined. So that also plays a role in what countries are using in their diet. And that brings me to the last part of my discussion, which is how do we prevent peanut allergy if we can? Um, and the most I found was early exposure and then also questionable microbiome, uh, which I know is kind of the hot topic right now. Um, so there was one study that looked at uh, peripregnancy consumption. And basically, a uh, long time ago, I think in the early 1990s, uh, there was a study that enrolled 100,000 nurses who answered detailed questionnaires, including lifestyle and medical history. Uh, and on this, the women actually reported their usual intake of peanuts and tree nuts. So this was great progressive thinking, whoever started this questionnaire. Then the offspring of these nurses we're part of the Grown Up Today study, the GUTS2 trial. And so basically in 2009, a food allergy questionnaire <clears throat> me, was sent to every mother whose child was in the GUTS2. They found there were 140 cases of peanut or tree nut allergy reported on this questionnaire, and that mothers who were nut allergic ate less nuts during pregnancy and introduced peanut to their child at a later age, so typically greater than two years old. The mothers who were not allergic ate more nuts and introduced their child to nuts earlier, whether it was peanut or tree nut. Uh, and that during this, they found that there was an inverse relationship related to nut ingestion by the mother and development of childhood allergy. Now it gets hard because if you're a mom who's nut allergic, what are you supposed to do? And so the ones that were nut allergic and reported eating either peanuts or tree nuts, it was typically flip-flop. So if you're a peanut allergic, you're like, well, I ate a bunch of almonds when I was pregnant. Or if you're almond allergic, you're like, well, I ate peanut butter when I was pregnant. And so it makes it a little bit difficult for the children of these women. Uh, <clears throat> this is just a table showing uh, the actual mothers with allergy and without allergy. Uh, and it basically broke it into how many servings per month of peanut or tree nut they were eating. Uh, and so basically you can see that the mothers with peanut or tree nut allergy ate significantly less uh, nut servings, and then their number of children with peanut or tree nut allergy was higher than the mothers that were able to eat nuts throughout the pregnancy. Um, there's also the debate of early childhood consumption, and this was a recent study that compared uh, the Jewish population in the UK to the Jewish population in Israel. And what they found was that initially they're in these countries, not the actual Jewish population, there's a rate of 1.85% of peanut allergic children versus 0.17% of peanut allergic children. Uh, the Jewish children in the UK have a 10 times higher risk for peanut allergy 
than Jewish children who are raised in Israel. And with this, they did not find any significant differences uh, in anything else other than the uh, area of where they, they were raised. Uh, in Israel, peanut is introduced earlier and in larger quantities. It's also eaten more frequently than in the UK. They looked at the median peanut uh, ingestion per month. It was 7.1 grams in Israel versus zero grams in the UK for ages eight to 14 months. And again, this dates back to that recommendation around the year 2000 uh, that don't give your child peanut until about age two. Uh, they also found that there was an inverse association between peanut consumption and in infancy and the prevalence of peanut allergy in childhood. So, this is for David. Uh, these, are, these are some of the snacks that children eat and they have a lot of peanut, peanut protein in them, called bomba. Uh, then there was one study I found that looked at the microbiome and try to stratify children into high risk or low risk. Uh, and basically they didn't find too much that really increased your risk of peanut allergy uh, other than your own family genetics. But they did find some things that decrease the risk. Uh, siblings, daycare, pet dogs, and randomly hepatitis A, which I don't recommend. <laughs> so uh, the only thing they found that substantially increased the risk was a cesarean section and they weren't really sure. They did look at antibiotic use and the gut uh, microbial uh, flora and didn't really find anything that they could pinpoint as far as increase or decrease risk. So I have multiple kids and multiple dogs. Yeah. They, oh, question. I, I read a, a, a brief report recently that I think it was Southwest Airlines that had a problem with peanut reaction. And all the airlines I've been flying in the past few years don't serve peanuts anymore. Yes. If you know, yeah. some do and some yeah. don't. Yeah. Um, some do. I had some peanuts. Yeah. Southwest does. Southwest does. Yeah. Southwest yeah. Southwest yeah. Southwest yeah. Southwest. And then it's also weird because even if they don't serve the peanut, every package they have says oh, processed with peanut, may contain yeah. peanut. So. Yeah. Here's a question from the outside. Could you give me your take on recent findings of biologically active peanut protein in the environment? as well as a direct relationship between household peanut consumption and peanut allergy risk. On the other hand, peanut tree nut consumption by pregnant women may be protective. That mentioned already, perhaps pregnant women should eat peanuts to keep the allergen out of the home environment. So the issue about getting sensitized from airborne sensitization is oh, okay. I see what you're suggestion. So the only thing I found talking about that was more in relation to those birch areas. So when I mentioned Sweden, they had the higher level of ERA H8. ERA H8. Um, they thought potentially that was due to respiratory sensitization in the environment versus the actual seed storage protein that are more common in the US. There's also some studies that look at if your child is severely atopic and for some reason you're putting peanut on their skin that may be a potential route of sensitization, uh, but as far as just breathing in peanut dust, I didn't see much on that. Is that what the, the question is? The studies in the UK, people think that the burden of peanut dust in a household is relevant to sensitization. <coughs> Gideon Lack, doesn't he think that? I didn't see a lot on that. Right. Just text it. I'm, I'm sure someone's looked into it. Uh, I got a lot of questions here on my cell phone. Are peanuts processed differently in the UK versus Israel? They did not find a significant difference in the processing, mostly because the majority of what they were eating was peanut butter, and that's roasted peanuts. Mike Weiss said, uh, question about anaphylaxis with oral immunotherapy versus virus. I don't think he means virus. I think what he's asking here is the risk of eosinophilic esophagitis with desensitization uh, protocols. I didn't see a lot on that. Um, there was one kind of review paper that briefly mentioned eosinophilic esophagitis, but wasn't looking at it as in regards to um, desensitization against or looking at it in individuals in these studies. Um, most of the individuals in the studies 
were ones who were oral food challenge and skin prick positive. Um, I didn't see much mentioned on if they ruled out eosinophilic esophagitis or not. I think it's like 10%. Yeah. That, they, that 10% of the kids that go through desensitization subsequently will have eosinophilic esophagitis too, like is it, after going through all this, what, what do you think? Is there any chance for us to have any of these treatment options available in the near future? I in think that, it'll be more of a maintenance. Attorneys. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think it'll be more of a maintenance. And, I, and a lot of the focus was, well, even if we can't cure you with peanut allergy, the nice thing is that when you're on an airplane, when you're at a friend's sleepover, when you go to college, if you're on this oral immunotherapy, and you accidentally get exposed to a Snickers bar or whatever, you're not going to have such a severe anaphylactic event that you die. And so I think that's the main benefit that we've gotten to thus far with all the different treatment options. But as far as inducing tolerance to the point where they can just go off their, uh, whether it's oral or sublingual immunotherapy, I don't know about that. I think if I remember correctly from Dr. Nadeau's lecture, the best results they were having with that potentially would have been these peanut patches. But we don't, I don't have the published results of that trial yet. Tillis yeah. isn't here, but I know that the company, the French company that's promoting the patch, sent out a press release saying that they definitely had a positive outcome and they're looking to do uh, subcutaneous with tree nuts and egg and other things as well, use it as a modality for yeah. all food allergies. Certainly, although it was a small group of, I think, about 20 patients we did, there were no systemic reactions mm -hmm. and haven't been. Yeah. There are patients who are on patches daily. Yeah. And we're going to do a milk study oh, later this patch. year, probably in the fall. So. I'll go back to the slide on tolerance. I turned away to look at the computer, and I didn't understand one. So the last point there, the other 12 had oral challenges. So these people were consistently for five years on oral immunotherapy. Yes. And still then, uh, did they come off for a certain time and then fail? So yes, so basically in the beginning, this point, sorry, point on the screen, here we go. So this one, they waited until the peanut IG was less than 15. And that's when they did the study. And these 12 individuals down here, their peanut IgE did not get lower than 15. And so at some point they were like, well, let's just do it anyway. So they stopped it for four weeks and did the challenge. And so if your peanut IgE never gets below that 15 cutoff, really you shouldn't be eating peanut. So if you got below 15 and you, and you became tolerant, mm -hmm. check them a year later off and see if they remain tolerant. They stopped for four weeks and then checked. But they didn't ask for long-term tolerance a year later. No. Only that one, yeah, at the bottom. And there hasn't been good results of long-term <laughs> tolerance. No, they have to stay on it. They yeah. go off of it. I mean, uh -huh. maybe a month. <laughs> but I guess, I mean, if you think about it, it's like desensitization to penicillin or something. You know, once you go off, <coughs> you can't just go out and take a course of amoxicillin five years later. Well, I don't know why it is different, because like right. maybe 70 percent of people on standard pollen uh, immunotherapy maybe do have long-term tolerance, at least I mean, uh, right. Steve Durham's paper showed maybe four years after stopping people were still tolerant. And I just don't know if it has to do with the severity of symptoms, uh, anaphylaxis versus you know, rhinitis. Um, But yeah, they, I'm sure they're still following those patients. I guarantee they're still following. Um, the ones that the ones that failed went back on oral immunotherapy, and are still on it. And so I'm sure they'll look into it in the future you know, as they follow these so the cohorts. Bottom line is send all your patients to Mary last week. No, <laughs> send them to Frank. Yeah, no, no. Kill us. Get the bubble. Yeah, it's not the bubble. They sell it. Where? Do, I think somebody brought it up a few months ago, but we're hoping in the next couple of months that we will have this food allergy clinic going at Children's. So sort of what, what we call higher risk, maybe, for some of these peanut patients where obviously not the ones that are over 15 or the epitope test is really high, but the ones are sort of in an indeterminate where you might want to not give them in your office. <laughs> yeah. But that's the caveat, actually, with all of these studies. Yeah. They excluded people who had life-threatening anaphylaxis 
from right. these protocols. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think the closest one was Lieberman. Um, that was that one that I talked about doing the skin prick test and the, the peanut IgE. And they looked at individuals who had relatively high levels in regards to including them in the oral challenge, but they were not undergoing the immunotherapy. So, but most, most studies, yes, do not include. You sort of glanced over the omalizumab loading yeah. and then peanut desensitization data, but that initial looked pretty, pretty positive to try and get them desensitized while it's in their system. And, and it does work very well so to get them, them up to maintenance, but then it, you either have to stay on the omalizumab or once you go off the omalizumab, it, you know, you still maintain the peanut ingestion. There's no added benefit in regards to tolerance using so omalizumab. So basically you just use them to get to maintenance yes. on their oral yes. desensitization yep. drop. And, and they, they had some studies showing less uh, side effects if they used the omalizumab with their desensitization protocol. But again, you still have to stay on it. There's no, there's no tolerance benefit from the IG. Sounds like a university clinic problem, I think. Get through, <laughs> get through to start desensitizing our peanut patients. I think. Yeah, that's I'm right. curious what people are doing with their highly motivated, highly wealthy patients. You can clearly treat them. If you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they want to pay for this. Well, they go to Stanford. Yeah. That one, uh, I was really going to an argument for the last meeting. Um, Baker. Uh, yeah, Jim Baker. Yeah. Moving it down to yeah. Portland or where's yeah. it? He's in Portland. Although my, my recollection is he's more doing like what, what Wasserman does in Texas and it's getting to where there's some level of tolerance figuring we're not so far nobody's curing the problem, so why go to five grams? Just go to a gram or so, figuring the odds of you having an accidental exposure higher than that or and really I think more and more Parents are asking that. You know, they, they're savvy. They've been on the internet. Like nobody's curing this, but I just want my kid to be a little more safe. Protected. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an interesting, interesting dynamic. Well, most of those trials are kids allowed to eat peanuts while they're on well, therapy. Yeah, but sometimes oh, when they get to some level, they'll have to like have a peanut butter cup. Yeah. Yeah, because one of the one of the studies, part of the actual passing of the oral challenge was not only can you eat this five thousand milligrams, but then an actual serving of peanut butter. So they called it like open feeding. So there's some talk previously about breaking the molecule down, the era H two and the peanut protein, and desensitizing people to the fragments. Is that data all stopped now, or are they continuing that line of research? I didn't see a lot. In regards to that, there was one paper I found that was uh, published in like food technology. That was a huge review of all the different processing modalities they tried with peanut and not a lot in regards to great results. Um, because not that it doesn't work, but then you alter the peanut so bad that it either doesn't grow well or you lose a lot of the nutritional value. And so. I heard people trying to make a hypoallergenic peanut. Yes. If you take out the allergenic proteins, you basically don't have a peanut. Yep. That's, yeah, exactly. <laughs>